I'm very pleased that I get the opportunity to discuss here today my concept of non-local consciousness based on scientific research on near-death experiences in survivors of cardiac arrest. A near-death experience, NDE, or an experience of enhanced consciousness during a period of apparent coma, still gives rise to many unbelieving and critical questions, especially by physicians and neuroscientists. But as already William James one century ago has said, to study the abnormal is the best way of understanding the normal. How can it scientifically be explained that people can have clear memories from a period of obvious unconsciousness? Or how is it possible that permanent life changes occur after cardiac arrest of only two minutes? Being a cardiologist, I have been able and privileged to study patients with an NDE during cardiac arrest since 1986. And since then, my scientific curiosity was more and more provoked because according to our current medical concepts, it is not possible to experience consciousness during a cardiac arrest when circulation and breathing have ceased. In medical school, I had always learned that it was obvious that consciousness was the product of a functioning brain. But now the phenomenon of near-death experience raised a number of fundamental questions. How and why does an NDE occur? And how does the content of an NDE come about? And even more important questions for me were, how is consciousness related to the integrity of brain function? And is it possible to speak of a beginning of our consciousness and will our consciousness ever end? But first, what is an NDE? Some people who have survived a life-threatening crisis report an extraordinary experience. An NDE can be described as a reported memory of a range of impressions during a special state of consciousness, including a number of universal elements, such as an out-of-body experience with theoretical perceptions, pleasant feelings, seeing a tunnel, a light, diseased relatives, a life review, or the conscious return into the body. And many circumstances are described during which NDEs are reported, such as cardiac arrest, clinical death, shock after loss of blood, childbirth, coma, following traumatic brain injury or stroke, drown, near drowning, children, or asphyxia, but also in serious diseases, not immediately life-threatening, during depression, isolation, meditation, or without any obvious reason. And similar experiences to any uh, can occur during the terminal phase of illness and are called end-of-life experiences. And the NE is always transformational, always causing profound changes in life inside, the loss of the fear of death, and enhanced intuitive sensitivity. So this is why these kind of experiences are also called spiritually transformative experiences, or STE. And near-death experiences occur with increasing frequency because of the improved survival rate of re resulting from modern techniques of resuscitation. And the content of the NDE and the effects on patients seem similar worldwide across all times, all cultures. And according to a recent inquiry in Germany and the USA, about 4% of the total population in the Western world should have experienced an NDE, which means that more than 9 million people in the USA and about 20 million people in Europe must have had an NDE. So why do we physicians hardly ever hear a patient tell about his NDE? Patients are so reluctant to share their experience with others by all the negative responses they get. For most physicians, is the NDE an incomprehensible and still unknown phenomenon. And once a conference was held about NDE in a university hospital with more than 300 people in attendance. And at the end of the conference, after several lectures about NDE, a man stood up and said, 
I am a cardiologist for more than 25 years, and I have never heard such absurd stories. This is total nonsense. I don't believe one word of it. And then another man stood up in the, poll, in the audience and said, I am one of your patients. <laughs> I have had an NDE, and you would be the last one I would ever tell. <laughs> they feel exactly that these kind of physicians are not able to listen. Now, until recently, there was no prospective or scientifically designed study to explain the cause and content of an NDE. All studies had been retrospective and very selective with respect to, patient, in respect to patients. And retrospective studies many years can elapse between the occurrence of the NDE and its investigation, which often prevents accurate assessment of medical circumstances. We wanted to know if there could be a physiological pharmacological, psychological, or demographic explanation why people experience consciousness during a period of clinical death. So in 1988, we started a prospective study of 344 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals with the aim to investigate the frequency, the cause, and content of an NDE. And we studied patients who survived cardiac arrest arrest, which is also called clinical death. And this is a well-described, life-threatening medical situation where patients will ultimately die from irreversible damage to the brain if cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, is not initiated within five to 10 minutes. It is the closest model of the process of dying. And we also performed a longitudinal study with interviews after two and eight years with a match control group of patients without NDE to assess if the transformation was caused by the NDE or by the cardiac arrest itself. This had never been studied before in a prospective design. This cartoon was published in a Dutch newspaper when our study was published in The Lancet in December 2001. What we found is that 282 patients, 82%, had no recollection of the period of cardiac arrest, of the period of unconsciousness. However, 62 patients, 18%, reported some recollection of the period of clinical death. And of those patients, 41, 12%, had a core experience with a score of six or higher, and 21, 6%, had a superficial NDE. And in the longitudinal study, we found that the loss of the fear of death, the transformation in attitude toward life, and an enhanced intuitive sensitivity only occurred in patients with an NDE. And it was a surprising finding that an experience of only some minutes causes such a lifelong transformation. We also found that despite the mostly positive experience, the NDE was also a traumatic event because there's hardly any acceptance by doctors, nurses, family, friends, and partner with a divorce rate of more than 70%, which makes the process of acceptance and integration very difficult. And this process will take many, many years with strong feelings of depression, homesickness, and loneliness. But the longer the interval between NDE and the interview, the more positive changes are usually reported. The NDE can indeed be considered as a spiritual crisis. Now, what might distinguish the small percentage of patients who report an NDE from those who do not? We found, to our surprise, that neither the duration of cardiac arrest, two or eight minutes, nor the duration of unconsciousness, five minutes or three weeks in coma, nor the need for intubation in complicated CPR, nor induced cardiac arrest and electrophysiological stimulation, EPS, had any influence on the frequency of NDE. The severity or duration of anoxia did not matter at all. Neither could we find any relationship between the frequency of NDE and administered drugs, fear of death before the arrest, nor foreknowledge of NDE, gender, religion, or education. 
And in the past, several theories have been proposed to explain the NE. However, in our prospective study, we could exclude that psychological, pharmacological, or physiological factors cause these experiences during cardiac arrest. With a purely physiological explanation, such as cerebral anoxia, most patients who had been clinical that should report an NE, but only 18% reported an ND, although all patients in our study had been unconscious because of anoxia of the brain resulting from the cardiac arrest. Besides, as I told you before, it is a well-established fact that people without any lack of oxygen in the brain, like in depression or meditation, can also experience an enhanced consciousness, a so-called spiritually transformative experience. In four prospective studies with identical study design, our Dutch study, a study from the USA and two studies from the UK, about the same percentage of NDE was found in a total of 562 patients. Bruce Grayson writes in his comments that no one physiological or psychological model by itself could explain all the common features of an NDE. The paradoxical occurrence of heightened lucid awareness and logical thought process during a period of impaired cerebral perfusion raises particular perplexing questions for our current understanding of consciousness and its relation to brain function. A clear sensorium and complex perceptual processes during a period of apparent co clinical death challenge the concept that consciousness is localized exclusively in the brain. As Sempani and Peter Fennick from the British study write that the data from several NDE studies suggest that the NDE arises during unconsciousness. And this is a surprising conclusion because when the brain is so dysfunctional that a patient is deeply comatose, those cerebral structures which underpins subjective experience and memory must be severely impaired. Complex experiences, such as reported in the E, should not arise or be retained in memory. Such patients would be expected to have no subjective experience. A penetratory concludes that according to mainstream science, it is quite impossible to find a scientific explanation for the NDE as long as we believe that consciousness is only a side effect of a functioning brain. The fact that people report lucid experiences in their consciousness when the brain activity has ceased is, in her view, difficult to reconcile with current medical opinion. Such a brain couldn't even hallucinate. It couldn't do anything at all. So we have to come to the surprising conclusion that in our and other studies during cardiac arrest, and he was experienced during a transient functional loss of all functions of the cortex and the brainstem with a flatline EEG. But how do we know that the EEG is flat in those patients with cardiac arrest? Through many studies with induced cardiac arrest, both in human and animal models, Cerebral function has been shown to be severely compromised during cardiac arrest with complete cessation of cerebral flow, causing unconscious, sudden loss of consciousness and of all body reflexes, the function of the cortex, but also with the abolition of all brain stem activity, like the loss of the gag reflex, the corneal reflex, and fixed and dilated pupils are clinical findings in those patients. And also the function of the respiratory center localized close to the brainstem, fails, resulting in apnea. And the electrical activity in the cerebral cortex, but also in the deeper structures of the brain and animal studies, have been shown to be absent after 10 to 20 seconds, a flatline EEG. And in an acute myocardial infarction, the duration of cardiac arrest in the coronary care unit is always longer than 20 seconds usually at least 60 to 120 seconds. And in a hospital ward or in an out-of-hospital arrest, it, is, it even takes much longer. So all 562 survivors of cardiac arrest in the four prospective studies 
must have had a flatline EEG. However, some patients with an NE could report an enhanced consciousness. And because of the occasional and verifiable out-of-body experiences, we know that the NE must happen during the period of unconsciousness and not in the first or last second of cardiac arrest. Now, the inevitable conclusion that the NE occurs during cardiac arrest when the function of the cortex and brainstem have ceased is often called impossible and unscientific. The quite often proposed objection that the flat lie EEG is, does not rule out any brain activity because it is mainly a registration of the electrical activity of the cerebral cortex misses the mark. The issue is not whether there is any brain activity of any kind whatsoever, but whether there is brain activity of the specific form regarded by con contemporary neuroscience as the necess necessary con condition for conscious experience with measurable activities in many neural centers, the so-called global neural workspace. And it has been proven that there is no such acti specific brain activity at all during cardiac arrest. The quest to find consciousness. Based on recent and these studies in survivors of cardiac arrest, the widely accepted hypothesis that consciousness and memories are produced by large groups of neurons and are localized in the brain should be discussed. Because with our current medical and scientific concepts, it seems impossible to objectively explain all aspects of the subjective experiences as reported by patients with an ND during a transient loss of all functions of the brain. Scientific study of ND pushes us to the limits of our medical and neurophysiological ideas about the range of human consciousness and the mind-brain relation. Current materialist science is based on the idea that objective, objective reality can be demonstrated by physical observable and so-called objective data. But we should realize that besides objective data, also subjective aspects like thoughts, feelings, inspiration, and intuition are an essential part of our subjective reality. Direct evidence of, of how neurons or neuronal networks could possibly produce the subjective essence of the mind and thoughts is currently lacking. So we have to admit that it seems impossible to reduce consciousness to neural processes as conceived for contemporary neuroscience, because it is still an unproven assumption that consciousness and memories emerge from brain function. And until now, there has is no scientific evidence for neural correlates of all subjective aspects of subjective experience. So we cannot measure what we think or feel because we cannot measure the content of our subjective consciousness. We measure just changing activation. And neural activation is simply neural activation. It only reflects the use of structures. And faced with the aforementioned findings about NDE and SD, we should question the purely materialist paradigm in science. Science, I believe, should be the search for explaining new mysteries rather than to stick with old concepts. So it is indeed a scientific challenge to discuss new hypotheses that could explain the possibility to have clear and enhance consciousness with memories, with self-identity, with cognition, with emotion, with the possibility of theoretical perception out and above the lifeless body. To explain the reported interconnectedness with the consciousness of other people and of diseased relatives. To explain the possibility to experience instantaneously and simultaneously, non-locality, a review and a preview of someone's life in a dimension without our conventional body link concept of time and space, where all past, present, and future events exist, and even to explain the experience of the conscious return into the body, which is experienced as something very oppressive. 
In my recent book, Endless Consciousness, which has been published in the English language by HarperCollins, entitled Consciousness Beyond Life, I describe a concept in which our endless consciousness with declarative memories finds its origin in and is stored in a non-local real, and the brain only serves as a relay station for parts of these informative fields of consciousness to be received into or as our waking consciousness. The function of the brain should be so be compared with a transceiver, a transmitter receiver or interface. Different neuronal networks function as plates of resonance for different aspects of our consciousness. And the function of neuronal networks should be regarded as receivers and conveyors, but not as retainers of consciousness and memories. In this concept of non-local consciousness is not rooted in the measurable domain of physics, our manifest world. However, the physical aspects of consciousness, our waking consciousness, which presumably originates from the wave aspect of our consciousness through collapse of the wave function, objective reduction, can be measured by means of neuroimaging techniques like EEG, fMRI, and PET scan. And with this concept of non-local consciousness, all reported elements of an anti during cardiac arrest could be explained. But I also realize that many aspects of consciousness are still a great mystery. In trying to understand the concept of interaction between non-local consciousness and the material body and brain, it seems appropriate to compare it with modern worldwide communication. At this very moment, we are invaded by hundreds of thousands of telephone calls, by hundreds of ra radio and TV programs, and by more than a billion websites, the cloud. But we become only aware of these electric magnetic informative fields at the moment we use our mobile telephone, or by switching on our TV, radio, tablet, or laptop computer. And what we receive is neither inside the instrument, nor in its components, nor produced by it, but thanks to the receiver, the information from the electromagnetic fields becomes observable to our senses, and hence perception occurs in our consciousness. For me, science means asking questions with an open mind. And he who has never changed his mind because he could not accept your concepts has rarely learned something. Since the publication of several prospective studies of any in survivors of cardiac arrest, with strikingly similar results and conclusions, the phenomenon of NDE can no longer be scientifically ignored. According to the studies, the current materialistic view of the relationship between the brain and consciousness held by most physicians, philosophers, and psychologists is too restricted for a proper understanding of this phenomenon. There are good reasons to assume that our consciousness does not always coincide with the functioning of our brain. And hence, consciousness can sometimes be experienced separately from the body. There are still more questions than answers, but I have come to the inevitable conclusion that most likely the brain must have a facilitating and not a producing function to experience consciousness. And that consciousness is a non-local phenomenon because what we can experience in our consciousness is beyond time and space. And because during any enhanced consciousness can be experienced independently of brain function, it is for me beyond reasonable doubt that after physical death, our endless or non-local consciousness will be, still be experienced. So we have a body and we are consciousness. Because without the body, we still can have conscious experiences. We still are conscious beings. And death is only the end of our physical aspects. And this is why I believe that presumably death, like birth, may be a passing from one state of consciousness into another. And I realize now that consciousness is fundamental and that everything originates from consciousness. Regarding what we can learn from people who are willing to share the NDE with others, I would like to quote Dark Hammarskjöld. Our ideas about death define how we live our life. 
Because as long as we believe the death is the end of everything we are, we will give our energy toward the temporary and material aspects of our life. In our short-sightedness and sometimes willful ignorance, we forget to reflect about the future of our planet, where our children and grandchildren will have to live and survive. We forget about sustainability, as we are now destroying and exhausting systematically our planet just because we are living in a competitive and materialist society. We should realize that the harm we cause to others and to nature ultimately is harming ourselves because we as humans are not only intensively interconnected and tangled with each other, but also with animals and plants living on this endangered earth. I hope that in the near future we will accept non-local concepts to understand how we are and always will be interconnected with each other also after physical death, and that we have to change our personal consciousness to change the way we live. It will require a huge change in consciousness indeed. We should all feel the responsibility for this change. Thank you for your attention. We have a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, Pim, thank you so much. I, I guess that, you know, this is fascinating, and I was just reading uh, Huffington Post about your work and how you're bringing, you know, soul back into studies of consciousness, et cetera, and others. But is there, in your exploration of, you know, what you've observed in these near-death experiences and that something is there, do you have confidence that science, the science side of this, can continue to progress to further come to terms yeah. with what you've explored, or does it remain as uh, uh, a, a placeholder that there is something out there that we know, but we can't get farther than we are now in knowing about it? It depends on your definition of science. Hmm. If you have the definition of materialist science, then we cannot prove or duplicate or objectively explain consciousness because we cannot measure it. We cannot reproduce it. So consciousness is outside materialist science. So we have to change science into all-inclusive science, which means that we have to include subjective experiences. Mm, interesting. So we have to change science. Mm, thank you. Again, to bring <coughs> the Eastern wisdom traditions, yes. which have always held that we are non-local beings having I a know. local experience. I know. The bigger question is identity, because in the East, in Buddhism and Vedanta, Personal identity is an uh, impermanent um, illusion. The bigger identity is that you're an activity of the total universe, that as you go deeper into expanded states of consciousness, you can subjectively experience yourself exactly. as an impersonal field of potential or ground of being. A feeling of oneness. Be, so what is recycling is just states of information. Exactly. I agree with you. It's the feeling of, in the enhanced consciousness, it's, you're connected with everything, your feeling of oneness. There's only subjectivity. In this physical world, there's object and subject. And the enhanced consciousness is something else. 